<laughs> to the American government and and whoever uh, whichever FBI agent is listening in on this, we're all terrorists to them, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not. I'm just I'm just a dumb alcoholic. Do not check my basement. <laughs> I do not have anything in my basement. I do not store illegal weapons, officer. <laughs> Only illegal alcohol. Actually, I am drinking like arguably illegal alcohol that's completely 100% homemade by this random grandpa down the street that oh, I buy nice. it off of. It's not store bought. Yeah, and it's very good. Okay. Very limited hangovers. You so know. you have moonshine you can, too. You can, okay. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Everything, everything made by a grandpa down the street tastes better. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> will Will your illicit alcohol make you blind like moonshine will? <laughs> that, that is a myth that is a myth created by the Jim Beam Corporation hey, to go. sell you very overpriced uh, overproduced garbage whiskey you got no. Nick with the alcohol good history homemade alcohol <laughs> good homemade alcohol has as much of a chance to blind you as uh, bought alcohol does obviously you can fuck up with the ethanol uh, but uh, you know there's pro- there's fake booze at every bar that you probably go to Mm. uh because <laughs> capitalism so i i'd rather trust i'd rather trust uh boy and uh, grandpa from down the street than michael who has seven bars you know yeah uh, you heard it here first kids go and brew some alcohol <laughs> in your bathtubs you got Nick has, <laughs> has given you permission no not bathtubs there is proper way to make it i will show you i'll say I'll put, put links in description <laughs> of proper alcohol making equipment you can buy it you can create it on your own uh, papa yugopnik can make special episode and teach you how to make it absolutely no problem save yeah. money you buy a bunch of fruits you condense it into good rakia and you drink it for like a year straight then you spend like i don't know 500 euros for that very good shit uh, uh, I know a, a, a taxi driver who happens to like to be paid in jugs of, of this fucking bootleg alcohol. So if you, ever, if you guys ever need a taxi ride <laughs> somewhere around these parts, <laughs> you can pay it with bootleg fucking... <laughs> All right, today we are going to be talking about uh, reform or revolution, and this one is quite a a fraught topic that has been discussed for a very long time, Um, but if you you go on Twitter today, it, it seems like the same... The same arguments are being rehashed over and over again <laughs> that have that have already been resolved uh, by much smarter people many years ago. Um, but I think before we jump into that, let's touch on uh, some recent news. Let's talk about these uh, Pandora leaks. Excuse me, don't you mean the offshore leaks? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, oh, the Paradise <laughs> leaks, no? No, 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 no. The, the Panama ones, right? No, of course, no, no. It's the Pandora ones. Hey, uh, in two weeks, when everybody fucking forgets about <laughs> this shit... <laughs> Let's, just to remind that this stuff happens like what every like three months now yeah. and people just forget it's like trillions of dollars unaccounted for and people just fucking forget <laughs> and stop apologizing to each other stop apologizing <laughs> to each other audience they keep apologizing to each other they're too fucking nice these fucking arabs and these fucking americans over here you just jump into a conversation and you fucking ignore the other motherfucker exactly. until he stops talking but no yeah. i'm sorry oh you please go on oh you please go on 10 years Jesus, ten, ten right. years of I'm, civil war will do that to your manners <laughs> 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 I'm going to cut out all the apologies so you sound like a lunatic, you got Nick. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> oh, fuck. Sorry. Anyways, uh, the uh, my point, the fucking stupid rat. Okay, my point is this. For people who may not be aware, recently, uh, just, well, it happens every couple of months to every uh, half year, there is some massive leak of a very large amount of information, like documents, scanned emails, and uh, all that kind of stuff, detailing basically, ooh, the, you know, underbelly of of, uh, this dark capitalist world that we live in. Um, In this particular case, with the Pandora leak, what happened was there was, I think, something like two or three terabytes worth of information that was just completely leaked with, you know, a blatant detail, um, the details of which, by the way, is just how hard you're getting fucked by the capitalist class. Um, basically, the gist of it is there's hundreds of these mega wealthy, like insanely wealthy people that have basically shell companies, offshore uh, structures, tax havens, all, trusts and whatnot within tax havens, um, you know, the ones fucking Monaco, Panama, and apparently South Dakota is one, which I was not fucking expecting, <laughs> but whatever. You usually hear, you know, Bahamas or the Cayman Islands, but yeah, uh, they have all these, uh, sh- um, what's it called? 
uh, companies are basically bullshit set up just to avoid taxes. Um, and uh, the amounts are staggering. You'd think, oh, you know, maybe they're avoiding like a billion dollars, two billion, billion dollars of tax money, you know, uh, pocket change for these fucking uh, parasites. But no, the actual number as measured by the OECD is $11.3 trillion. 11.3 um, I don't know if you understand, like, this is a, fuck, it's, it's even hard to wrap your head around, right? A billion, no. a thousand million, right? A trillion is a thousand billion. Now, multiply that by 10. It's an infathomable, uh, it, like, insane amount of money. Um, and the uh, nice little bow to tie it all together is, the next time you hear a congressman or a politician tell you that you can't have health care, remember that there's uh, fucking $11.3 trillion uh, that are unaccounted for, you know, just to Jeez. keep, uh, like, what, 50 people uh, around the world warm at night roughly roughly money not registered by most accounts mm -hmm. money not registered meaning money that is not taxed corresponds to around 10 percent of global gross domestic product jesus maybe more 10 percent that's a lot of yachts villas yeah. and most importantly black bmws <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, no just a question isn't the china's gdp like share of the entire world also like around there like 13 14 percent or something so we're talking about the amount of wealth that's the size of, like, basically China's economy, I think. That's insane. Just, ugh. I don't even know how to, how to react to it anymore. I mean, every, just so frequently there are these leaks that are like, oh, yeah, I mean, this, this handful of ultra-rich billionaires are, are stashing an even larger sum of money than was revealed last time in these new places. And, and then freaking South Dakota, which is... <laughs> Some place that is incredibly boring and and no one ever thinks of, but I think that's part of um, if we're if we're talking about the um, these individual billionaires, it's interesting to see that there are no U.S. leaders or U.S. names on the list. Um, mm. And I mean, you I can, wonder you why. Can put, yeah, exactly. You can you can put on your tinfoil hat and and say, well, it's this was uh, all an op um, to make other world leaders look bad and and U.S. look like. The gold standard, but um, it's it's honestly it's a mix of of both that um, the group behind the Pandora Papers, ICIJ, uh, is indeed funded by a CIA front group, uh, the Ford Foundation, among other things. But it's also that the U.S. just has absurd tax loopholes that these people can take advantage of and just stash their money wherever and not be taxed on you know godlike sums of money. Whereas normal people have to pay out the nose for, you know, to cover all the, you know, fixing potholes and, and national parks and all that stuff. But not the rich people. No, not them. And even if you do try to launder some cash through whatever means and methods that you might find is most profitable for yourself and you get caught afterwards, the punishment is often absolutely hilarious. As an example, I wrote this down, the Vista Equity CEO, Robert Smith for example, admitted on hiding, admitted $2.5 billion in tax and uh, what the greasy mouth breeding judges gave him as punishment was uh, pretty much you have 10 years to pay it off. I mean, okay, Jeez. it's a place to start, but if you steal a car, uh, you just pay it off or you get uh, two years in jail, obviously the latter. So the, the, the bigger you are, the less the law applies on you. As cliche as it sounds, it applies to pretty much every aspect of the law and in finances, arguably the most. Uh, but it's very funny to me how like the U.S. constantly and uh, throughout uh, the previous decades as offshoring has become a bigger and bigger thing, has condemned, you know, these foreign tax havens. Uh, and now, as you said, JT, we have uh, fucking South Dakota, which uh, I hope at least the tax haven money that goes into there can uh, bring it up to uh, lifestyle standards of uh, Monaco or Monte Carlo. <laughs> I can already imagine uh, uh, fucking Porsches and Lambos driving down the Riviera, the South, ha <laughs> South, South Dakota Riviera. But uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the craziest thing about, especially in South South Dakota, but also internationally. But when you when you launder money inside of your own your own uh, 
country. Most of it is uh, pretty legal. You can uh, say that uh, you are putting all your money in a company which by itself as an LLC is an individual entity. And you can say that's for privacy reasons. I don't want people to know just how much money I have, which for some reason legally you are kind of allowed to. The government can know, but not like uh, the public. Um, once this entity exists, basically with its own capital, it can do almost anything it wants unless somebody starts poking around and ends up tying it to laundering. So uh, that's how it ends up to that 10% that, uh, that uh, you know, we previously talked about. It's, uh, it's pretty crazy shit. And the fact that it keeps happening, like as you guys said, every, every few years and that uh, at this point uh, we're weirded out when it, uh, we don't hear anything about this because we're so used to the rich doing this tells us just how complacent and just how uh, basically okay we are with the situation we find ourselves in. You know, you get fucked long enough, it starts feeling good. <laughs> Not only this, but the, of course, the media being just tentacles of the uh, ruling class. Obviously, they're not gonna, you know, shine a spotlight on this. They're gonna have to report on it because it's blatantly obvious that if they don't, then their interests and who they serve it becomes, uh, you know, kind of uh, very clear to everybody who's uh, taking a look. But uh, yeah, so they report on it for a day or two, and then they completely forget and never mention it again. And mm -hmm. meanwhile, the uh, journalists in question either end up dead or are on the payroll of this or that uh, government or institution. But uh, JT, you said something very interesting. You said um, that uh, the, the, the leaks revealed that most of the people, if not, I think all of them, were non-US politicians, and not a single American politician showed up in the leaks. Um, I think there's a very simple explanation for that, and that's just because in the United States, politicians and businessmen do not dodge taxes, okay? It is the <laughs> simplest explanation. <laughs> in the U.S., everybody's honest, particularly the businessmen, all right? Members of Cong Congress and the Senate, the political class entirely, and their ruling masters. They pay every single cent of the taxes. In fact, they even give more because of, they're just such good-hearted people, all right? So please, yeah, uh, you're right. Cool it I, with the anti-Americanism, okay? You're absolutely <laughs> right. I was being way too harsh on them. I mean, if, Nancy Pelosi is just like a fantastic investor. I mean, she's just she's really smart. You know, she gets there's there's it's um it's not suspicious at all that her success rate is like three times as good as Warren Buffett. It's you know she's not leveraging her power at all to to do insider <laughs> trading. Please, the market is free and fair. All right, let's mm. not enough of this. Uh, you guys are starting to sound like communists, okay? <laughs> <laughs> We've been found out. So, generally, this, I think, uh, do you guys still want to talk further about the, the, the Pandora leak? There's not much more to say. There's right? not much more to say. I mean, I think it's it's just the latest example of, of a, a system that we know is, is screwing us. Um, and the question is, what do we do about it, right? Yes. So, I guess that, exactly will, right. that will lead us into our next <laughs> our next uh, subject of discussion reform or revolution can we reform a system that allows these things these things to happen or does more dramatic action need to be taken uh, i think uh, we can begin with just a few definitions just for so everybody's on board um, we have to keep in mind that we live in a capitalist system, and this capitalist system as well allows these, you know, millionaires and multi-billionaires and eventually probably even trillionaires to get away with whatever they want, um, because the system is made for them, by them, and all that. When we talk about reformism or revolution, what we're talking about is an end goal that would be socialism, right? Um, the reformists, or reformism, is basically an idea that we can achieve socialism through reforming, through elections, democratic participation, all that kind of stuff, in a bourgeois state, in a state ruled by capitalist interests, and other such fairy tales. Um, you're, the, the gist of it, I think, is to think of it like this. You're trying to beat the rich and powerful at their own game. And honestly, if you look at uh, the history of the 20th century, um, you see that that hasn't worked out very well. You can just ask Allende about that. Um, revolution, on the other hand, is the idea or understanding that socialism can be achieved through the forceful overthrow, ooh, authoritarian, the uh, forceful overthrow of the capitalist class in which we dispossess them of their wealth, power, and privilege. So basically a you know, system set up by incredibly wealthy people to protect their own interests won't be shaken by uh, you know the structures and institutions and civil uh, administrations that uh, they themselves set up. Uh, you can't shake them out of the system. 
um, you might need to, you know, do a little more. And that little more can be revolution. And you go, Nick, what do you have to say? Yeah, I mean, like the, the topic we talked about previously uh, completely links into this because here we're looking at some of the highest end individuals from Putin to Shakira, Shakira, who have <laughs> like all eyes on them. Uh, the likes of uh, kings and presidents even, and they found their ways, their way around policies, which most often are set up by reformists in an attempt uh, to stop the corrupting nature of the given system. And it just tells us that uh, the disease of capitalism is kind of not to be treated as a common cold, but, you know, rooted out more like a disease more akin to, to a cancer, which links us exactly to what we're talking about today, uh, reform or revolution. And back in the day, I, I also have this written down, this, uh, this motherfucker called Bernstein <laughs> uh, said, uh, who is, one could say, the father of reformism uh, back at uh, towards the end of the of the, the, the 20th century, uh, 20th, yeah, 20th, fuck me, I, the 21st is now 20th as the previous one, uh, the key is starting to kick in, <laughs> quote unquote, capitalism, capitalism has proven itself already, it's the most effective way of improving quality of life, and as time goes on, it's only getting better at handling crises and democratically distributing wealth, mm -hmm. why risk the progress we're making? And at the turn of the previous century, Bernstein, this social democrat who predicted a world market which would stabilize through superior organization, got to 1907. And surprise, surprise, we have the world famous New York stock market plunge that went into a massive crisis followed by years of recessions and uh, market and bank failures pretty much all across the world. And we've seen a continuous repeat of the same market crashes every eight to 15 years after that, with uh, one probably, let's be honest here, coming uh, to remind us of this shit show very, very soon. So what I'm trying to like put here as some of the first point that we can discuss is that the first critic of the uh, revolutionary model, uh, the first uh, reformist who came up with these ideas had obviously people standing up to, to these sort of uh, uh, quasi, uh, quasi Marxist ways of thought, even though he, they were literally non Marxist socialists as Bernstein identified himself after he got expelled from the country and then started hanging out with some fucking idiots. But doesn't <laughs> matter. And then we, that's where we get to that's where we get to the beautiful, lovely, okay, let's be honest, not very beautiful, but the beautiful <laughs> uh, mind, Lady uh, Luxembourg in the aptly titled uh, book Reform or, or Revolution. Uh, who criticized Bernstein, uh, Bernstein extensively and very properly, and the rest is uh, the rest is pretty much history. I'll let you guys speak. I just wanted to finish on another mm -hmm. thing. Uh, I, I wrote it down. Actually, I wrote it down on a piece of paper. I, it, was, it felt really good. I, I thought I forgot how to use a, a pen because of all of these fucking keyboards all the time. But I was like, okay, let's act like a proper intellectual uh, New York uh, podcaster and have everything down on a little note because, you know, computers are too, uh, too uh, 21st century for us, baby. Uh, so uh, the, the Lady Luxembourg identified Bernstein's so-called evolutionary socialism as the quote-unquote first attempt to give a theoretic base to the opportunist currents common in the social democracy. My God. Now tell me that socialists have not changed uh, that socialists have changed to this day. This is the type of shit we write on Twitter all the fucking time. <laughs> Just she was much more right than the type of shit that we write. So yes, Habibi, this is uh, for people who uh, want the TLDR of what you Gopni said, which was very beautifully presented. It's this: what what Luxembourg did was she uh, drew um, uh, Bernstein as the soy wojack and herself as the Chad wojack. Okay. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> oh, now I get it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, stu stupidity aside, um, yeah, it's 
kind of funny to realize that this conversation that was solved a hundred years ago, more than that even, uh, she wrote Reform Revolution in 1901 or 1900. It's been a a minute since she's wrote that work, and uh, it's uh, 2021 now. So you can imagine for 120-some years, people are still having the same conversations over and over again. But the only difference is um, the other side, the opportunist reformer side, they don't actually have theory that they mm-hmm. refer to. Nobody reads Bernstein anymore. Nobody reads Kautsky for the most part, right? They just kind of have this vibe in their head. They think it's like this. Meanwhile, the people on the other side, on the uh, side of al-haq, as we say in Arabic, of the truth, <laughs> <laughs> is uh, w- like we reference. We reference Luxembourg. We reference what Lenin wrote against Kautsky and other reformists, etc., and opportunists. We uh, reference, of course, Mao even had some um, relevant writings on this. But the point that I'm trying to make is that the people who Sorry, are I will interrupt you. I will interrupt you. Mm. The, the only reason I know who the fuck Kotsky is is because <laughs> Lenin keeps fucking referring to him everywhere. <laughs> the fucking Kotsky motherfucker, that piece of shit. That's the only reason. The like history will remember Kotsky as mm. that guy that Lenin really didn't fucking like. Yeah, that's basically. Yeah. Right. The renegade Kotsky. That's literally the title on the fucking Voltaire <laughs> and the renegade Kotsky. That and also what's the... Uh, what's the other guy? The the dude that's only he's only known because Marx dunked on him. Um, Sterner, Sterner it was fucking Sterner. Sterner, yes. yes yeah, yes, yes. that guy who he's fucking got very cool avatars though. Yeah, I think Engels was the guy who uh, drew that little uh, caricature of him. But yeah, it, it just we only know about Sterner because Marx dunked on him so much. <laughs> same thing with Kautsky, uh, with Lenin. Same thing with Bernstein because of Luxembourg and so on, so on. Um, but yeah, that's the the the. Uh, kind of gist of it. And if you read the work, which by the way, I highly recommend people go and read Reform Revolution. It's an excellent work. It's very short as well. Um, if you read it, you'd think that was written like a week ago. Honestly, it's the same fucking questions, the same bullshit. Oh, cooperatives. Oh, we just need more elections. Oh, the, uh, you know, um, like more trade unions means that we're getting more socialists. More healthcare means we're more social. The same fucking, you know, socialism when the government does, does stuff, right? Yeah. So it's... Uh, Yeah, I mean, this stuff has all been hashed out before and a long time ago and by people who knew what they were talking about, um, arguably more than most people do today. But Mm. as easy as it is to to say, you know what, everyone just stop listening to this podcast and go read the, the works that have been written on this subject before. I think it'll be a little easier if we can kind of expedite the process and I can give, yeah. um, I can act as the average American or average person who's not super familiar with the with this um the struggle between reform and revolution. And I'll bring up a few questions or concerns that people typically have uh, when talking about revolution. All right, brace yourselves. Here we go. Oh, boy. I'll start with this one. Why can't we just be like the Nordic countries? They have good stuff, (laughs) and they got there through reform. For sure. You go, I'll let the Arab... No, no, Arab, go, go, Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Would you you allow me to go first? Okay. Um, Absolutely. Tear them out new fucking (laughs) ones. All right. I I really don't like this um, argument, but the reason I don't like it is because it's usually well-meaning. The people who say this stuff aren't trying to be like, oh, socialism doesn't work, (laughs) haha, good on paper, pee-pee-poo-poo. That's not what they're trying to say. The people who say this... uh, they have, you know, they're coming from a good place in their heart where they think, hey, why do we have to, you know, have like this uh, radical overthrow of the current order of things uh, when we can, you know, just kind of incrementally go towards what, you know, Norway or Sweden has? Uh, and the answer to this is very simple. Um, the, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm rem- reminded of that memory meme where uh, <laughs> the guy's like, how did SpongeBob acquire his house through jihad? <laughs> sorry, <to stop. laughs> I was like, how did the Nordic countries acquire their living standards? <laughs> Technically, yeah, through basically uh, uh, in on one side uh, on one side of a coin, it's through pillage and, and destruction of the third world, and through the other, it's through unequal exchange and uh, preferential trade agreements uh, that directly serve um, uh, imperial core countries. Um, the very fact that by geographical and uh, uh, you know. Um, linear circumstance, can we say, that Norway and Sweden and France, etc., happened to be in a part of the world that was in ascendancy, and as a result, ended up in being uh, in unions in which capital was more centralized than others, where capitalism developed earlier, so that basically they could um, ramp up their levels of production, and then afterwards with colonialism, uh, basically steal massive amounts of land across the earth, 
um, pillage the local people, exploit them to death, work them as basically slaves, control their local economic systems, um, steal their uh, resources, natural and otherwise. Um, and then afterwards, even with the fall of colonialism, well, it's only a veneer that kind of fell. Um, uh, what's left behind the curtain is the same structural uh, setup, right? Um, West African countries may not uh, be directly part of some, you know, French empire now, but uh, when it comes to the things that matter, their economic their economic systems are directly linked to that of France. Um, their uh, their currency is uh, controlled, or at least uh, controlled. Uh, excuse me. Or uh, basically, uh, the, the French banks have a direct hand over it, or they directly control the currency or reserves, be they gold or otherwise that they may have. Um, the uh, markets that are available in West African countries, for example, are uh, replete, if that's the correct word, uh, filled with French goods. Um, and uh, France is given preferential treatments be, uh, for all these sort of trade agreements because France specifically uh, puts um, French friendly um, dictators within these countries, uh, influencing all sorts of political dealings behind uh, the curtain as well as in front of it, etc, etc. Sweden and Norway are no different, okay? Just because Sweden didn't have an empire doesn't mean that they didn't directly participate in some of the most horrific actions um, of the past century. Same with Norway. Um, let's not forget that the Swedish were neutral um, in World War II and gladly sold um, and traded with Nazi Germany to basically, and avoided war, of course, to uh, build up their own uh, economy. And then afterwards, uh, Swedish companies are notoriously known for uh, not only, number one, directly having um, preferential uh, control over many uh, different sorts of uh, resource locations around the world, as well as preferential treatment with trade agreements, but also there are many, uh, or one major export that uh, Sweden has is weaponry, be they uh, bullets or weapons or aircraft and whatnot, um, which one beneficiary is um, Israel, for example, uh, on and on. So what we're saying, or like the, the gist of this point is, um, the reason that the Nordic countries and the social democracy of the Nordic countries are the way they are is because of the exploitation and super exploitation of the third world. It's not because of anything intrinsic that they're doing that the United States couldn't just, you know, make a couple of tweaks, right? It's just the difference is that there are more concessions given to the working classes of the Nordic countries than uh, concessions are given to the working class of the United States, for example. So it's just a measure of the crumbs that the uh, ruling class gives to the working class, less so that, you know, Norway is somehow better and not imperialist and not uh, taking part in this uh, horrific capitalist, imperialist, and even neo-colonialist neo system. And let, even even if we were to sit down and say, okay, the, the thing we want to be is Norway or Sweden and ignore every single aspect that Hakim just talked about. My friends, the reason most Scandinavian countries have the policies in place which they do now is because they were neighboring one very big red bear mm. who indirectly showed their population throughout half of the previous century that you can do the same thing for yourselves as we have just achieved through the Russian Revolution literally over here 50 kilometers to the east so the scandinavian be it elite or be it reformists and i'm sure be it a lot of well-meaning people that were brainwashed by anti-soviet propaganda etc etc introduced a lot of these policies and reforms in order to what not allow what revolutions to happen on the territory of those Scandinavian states. So to combine this and to plug it into the larger topic of discussion here, even the definitions of success cases of reformist, uh, quasi-social democratic, whatever you want to call them, states such as Norway or Sweden, all the quote-unquote great achievements there brought to the local population have would not have been achieved without the threat of revolution so what i at, at the end of the day even the greatest achievements of reformists would not have been possible without revolutionaries knocking on the door exactly right 
the ruling class and the capitalist class is above all pragmatic. They understand the fact that if there is a risk of them losing it all, then they go two ways. Um, and this is why um, there's a saying by a certain Georgian individual, who I believe we're all fond of, um, that said that social democracy is objectively the moderate wing of fascism. The ruling class, in their pragmatism, they understand in a moment of peaked revolutionary activity, they can go two ways. Either they can go down the fascist route and basically ought to be completely autocratic, mix uh, corporate power and uh, political state power uh, directly together, and directly administer um, that which they want to, to uh, maintain their wealth and power and privilege, or they can go the social democratic route, which basically means, hey, we can give it, we can give up a bit of our privilege, a bit of our, uh, you know, uh, wealth, give a few concessions, right, pay a little more in taxes, but it means that on the grand scheme of things, we keep our boats and yachts and uh, massive tracts of land and uh, factories and all the all the stuff that you know they uh, foam at the mouth over basically, um, and that's what happened with these European social democracies. If it wasn't for the Soviet Union, they wouldn't have uh, participated in this uh, ex social democratic experiment. Uh, and the best uh, or the um, uh, yeah the best evidence for this is the fact that now that the Soviet Union is gone and it's been gone for several decades. All of a sudden, actually almost immediately, all these countries started um, putting in um, austerity measures. They started to slowly dismantle healthcare, slowly defund uh, education, slowly privatize different industries, etc., etc. Um, there are different examples across the board. In the UK, which was the, the social democratic paradise uh, of the 60s and uh, 70s until Thatcher came to power, um, they have been dismantling the NHS for decades now. In Sweden and Norway, I believe they recently lifted rent controls on, um, uh, what's it called, um, uh, or uh, rent limits uh, within cities, uh, which was, this is the first time it's uh, happened in, I think, decades. Um, in France, of course, uh, changes to labor laws and all that kind of stuff. On and on, the, the, the lists are unending, um, and that's kind of the point, right? So, uh, reformism, at the end of the day, is opportunism of the ruling class uh, in which they hope to keep their power and privilege. That's about it. I mean, even back in, uh, not to go back, but even when the Russian Revolution spread to Germany in, what was it, 1918, mm. the ruling class pretty much turned to the reformist leaders of the Social Democratic Party of Germany to pretty much save the system, which they kind of did by working with the government to dismantle revolutionary organizations, and mm. they mobilized even a counter-revolutionary -revolution militia which systematically murdered socialist leaders including Luxembourg herself in what, 1918-1919 mm. or yeah. something from what I remember. Dumped into a river. Um, but uh, I mean we'll, we'll talk about this in the in the later points which hopefully we will cover but you know it's, it's not uh, that uh, here we're saying that incremental changes which can help through reform, which can help the local population through reform, are are uh, to be looked at negatively. But uh, at least in, I don't want to speak for you guys, but at least in my eyes, a reform should be seen as a tool which can show the local population of just how much needs to actually be done in the local area or the local country or even the local continent to improve the conditions of, uh, of the working class and not as an end goal itself. Mm. That, is what, that is the main distinction that I find that differentiates uh, genuinely between just reformists or revolutionary Marxists. Revolutionaries do not say that, oh, uh, if we get uh, Medicare for, uh, you know, Americans, they'll get de-radicalized all over the place. And yes, mm. in the short term, they might be because it's a more comfortable situation. But in the long term, they will realize I have secured this right for myself. I have the ability to secure much uh, much greater rights in the future. But the reformist will come and say that the reform itself is the end goal. And uh, the fact that you got uh, Medicaid, Medicare or whatever the fuck you motherfuckers call it, you have so many fucking <laughs> words for Medicare, Medicaid, for m people getting fucking medicine and not dying on the street. Uh, they will say that this is the, the end goal and you should be happy with what you've got. Mm. Please sit in your corner, be quiet, be be docile, be nice, be respectful, go kiss the right hand, uh, <laughs> uh, kiss the ring, as they say, thank the right people, and uh, don't uh, and stop being as loud as you previously have been. 
these are the two kind of dichotomies that we will go through the throughout the, the rest of the podcast but yeah i just wanted to mention it now so we don't scare people away as you know these guys oh we do know revolution we must overtake it fuck mm. you who wants <laughs> you know to uh, to get i don't know uh, rent control in your state no that's not what we're saying but yeah. it's a it's a much more complicated sort of uh, c- conversation tail they are reforms they can be good but they're never enough basically that's kind of our, our perspective yeah all right let's tackle another one of these a, a really common one that uh, we hear here in the united states um even among people who kind of identify as quote unquote leftist is there's nothing wrong with capitalism it's crony capitalism that's the problem we just need to take the united states back to real capitalism where everyone has economic freedom not just the big corporations so this is it's a really <laughs> it's a really frustrating one, especially to hear mm. from someone who identifies as, if not socialist, at least quote unquote left. Um, mm. This idea that we had it right, it's just it's been perverted by these negative influences of uh, lobbyists or uh, giant corporations who just have too much power. So, mm. what do we say to people who say? look, we don't have capitalism right now. We have crony capitalism. Yeah, this is a very annoying talking point as well. Of course, not from the people who say it. I'm not saying the people who think this are annoying. It's just the talking point itself because it shows or reveals that the person in question hasn't really reflected that much on, on, on what they're saying um, because the claim here is that there is some unadulterated capitalism somewhere uh, at some point in time and that just now we have strayed off the path into some ooh, you know like evil for, form of capitalism that's not the case um, the idea that oh because when people say crony capitalism what they mean is that oh that means that corporations have more say in our economic life and politics uh, than before but there's a couple of points to this number one that this is a natural uh, tendency of capitalism um, and it goes like this if you go back to the early days of the you know, 1800s, let's say, um, there was a quote-unquote more fair quote-unquote capitalism in which most uh, production that was happening was on a much smaller scale. There are many more individual producers of things. Uh, there's a lot more competition, etc., etc. Um, when you have all of these different groups or co- corporations or companies, etc., that are trying to enter into a market and whatnot, um, their power in the, on, an individu- on an individual level is very little, right? Uh, so there's a lot of competition and whatnot. But in a competition, what happens? Somebody wins, obviously. And when somebody wins, do they just let their, you know, uh, the loser go on with their day and keep, you know, their uh, factories and workers and capital and all, and all that? No, they don't. They take every, they mercilessly d- demolish the competition so that they could emerge the victor and then they can become, they can grab a larger chunk of the uh, market share for themselves and once they grow bigger and bigger and bigger then you have these behemoths that we see in in like nowadays where for example you have one company that will control like 43 percent of the market share um and uh, this is always a a thing that i ask people to do think of something anything that you buy any uh, product um and in all likelihood there's probably only two major companies that with like 40 percent plus market share um, that uh, you're aware uh, you're aware of that sell the stuff. Um, we're not in the days of where you know there was 300 different companies or corporations making one product anymore. That was back in the day. But my entire point with this uh, conversation is when you become so big, right? Um, obviously, you're gonna try to get an, a further edge on the competition. And how would you do this? Obviously, you try to uh, impact the political system. How? Because the political system is one you made yourself. You directly control it. You're the one who funds the politicians. You're the one who funds the campaigns. You're the one who pays for the fucking banners and the paint and everything, right? You own the media. You get to say whatever you want in the media. And you can, if you even want to, pay be- people to basically think what you uh, think positively about you and what you're trying to do. That's what, for example, Bezos did when he bought the the, the Washington Post. Perfect example. What this results in, in the end, is that uh, you'll have massive companies that basically bribe or quote unquote uh, lobby uh, to bribe uh, the uh, local government and then the federal government and national government entirely um, to get whatever they want done. And it always happens because they have all the money, they have all the political and economic power. Um, the idea that this is something that could be mitigated or kind of like reversed or something would be mercilessly, mercilessly fought against on your side. If you were a particularly honest politician, I don't know why you'd be pro-capitalism if you were an honest politician. Um, even if you wanted to kind of uh, roll back capitalism to this point where you could have completely fair competition, you're going to be destroyed 
the people who own all the, you know, uh, who have all the capital and own all the media will, you know, uh, censor you into the ground or defame you into the ground, and they'll support all your enemy, political enemies and rivals so that they enter into power, and they are the ones who will directly do what those companies want them to do. Um, the issue at the end of this isn't uh, crony capitalism or whatever else. It's the fact that it is capitalism at the end of the day. It's its natural tendency to want to control political systems because political systems are directly uh, made from the economic base that, well, form this superstructure. <laughs> My third point basically is this. Um, if you uh, have a system in which um, those with a lot of capital co directly control the political system, which is what a capitalist system is, then no matter what you try to do against that, they'll always find a way to directly control that political system. So to try to kind of cover up in rosy language and say, oh, it's not this beautiful, you know, old style mom and pop capitalism, this evil fucking mercantile crony capitalism in which, you know, you have fucking fat guys that eat babies or whatever the fuck. It doesn't change the fact that it's capitalism at the end of the day. That's just my point. Right, exactly. And and that's, I get this comment a lot on my videos. It's like, look, you, you hate capitalism so much, but that's not real capitalism. It's crony capitalism or, or, or corporate capitalism or corporatism, whatever you want to call it. And my response to these people is always the same. It's that you wouldn't call stage four cancer and stage three cancer a different disease, right? Stage four cancer is just a more advanced form of the same disease. And that's what we see here in the United States. It's just a more advanced stage of capitalism um, that has become even more destructive, And but it's its natural tendency to progress in that manner. Beautifully put. And even if we, just to add on what both of you said, even if we imagine that, I don't know, crony capitalism is an actual fucking thing, uh, how would you go about returning it to what Hakim called mom and pop capitalism? So, I don't know. We limit the power of uh, massive corporations. Well, that's infringing on the free market. That means it's no longer capitalism. I don't know. How about we put a cap on property moguls who are driving the good old small landlords out of business? That's infringing on what? On property rights. So that's also no longer real capitalism. Let's uh, fucking bring back uh, all the outsourced labor from uh, China and all those insert racist word uh, <laughs> countries. Because if you're using this argument, you're probably uh, <laughs> racist as fuck. Uh, back, back, back to our country. Well, what are you thinking? This is infringing on the business rights of every uh owner to hire whoever they want so you'd no longer again sorry for repeating myself be living in real capitalism so all the solutions to what people like to call crony capitalism are inherently anti-capitalist it's a snake that eats its own oversized ass <laughs> you call greed good well, I'm sorry, but now live with the consequences of creating an, econo an economic system governed by it. In the arena of capitalism, the biggest cutthroat wins. Mm -hmm. Either become them or live under them since you're so in love with this fucking system. Mm -hmm. oh, that you, then you realize when you're like 36 or 7 and, you know, midlife crisis hits. Ooh, it's so difficult to become them. Uh, you, 80% of people die in the income bracket they're born into. Boo fucking who. Pull yourself up by your bootstrap, you fucking beta cuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think the general uh, point of an issue with this is that even if we wanted, like you got me say, even if we did go back to this mythical uh, state of uh, pure capitalism, um, the issue is that time is not static. It moves linearly forward so what you're gonna end up happening is basically you're just rewinding a bit for the same uh course of events to take place it will the same exact control of the increased control of market share will then lead to increased control of political parties or politicians lobbying direct control of uh, political campaigns etc etc which then leads them to directly control what uh, laws are passed and what kickback favors they get to and in the end we just basically end up in square one why do we want to stay eating it's over exactly. oversized ass exactly right yeah so let's get out break the circle by not trying to reform our way out of it, but by breaking entirely, which is the uh, stick that we like to call revolution. Yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, 
So then the follow-up to that point, usually, if people will concede that, okay, maybe you're right about the capitalism thing, they'll then go on to say, like, well, I think market socialism is a good compromise between capitalism and socialism. It still allows for the efficiency of markets, but maybe the government can tame some of capitalism's worst tendencies. And then you've got, you know, they'll bring up trade unions and co-ops, and they'll say they're the key to beating capitalists at their own game. What do we say about this? What do we think about trying to find a middle ground between socialism and capitalism? Uh, what I would say is read chapter 8 of Reform Revolution. But <laughs> the TLDR of that chapter is basically this. Um, first of all, uh, market socialism, maybe we'll make a further episode about this, but uh, in my opinion, there's no real, there's no such thing as market socialism. Yep. Um, the reason I don't like this is because markets inherently reproduced capitalist structures that's what they do uh, every second of every minute of every day right uh, what you end up having within a market is basically a system of competition that's what markets are based on right you have to have numerous different enterprises competing at a market what happens when you have different enterprises competing one of them wins like we mentioned before if one of them wins do they let the other one just live no they mercilessly destroy it so they conquer market share get increased capital have more workers that they can exploit etc etc what does this then result in this results in one enterprise having all this capital and power uh, and of course the people who run it be they cooperative or in a, um, a capitalist system where it's just a board of directors um, they'll have all they'll grow in in, in power and, and, and uh, privilege basically while the other enterprise that failed in a capitalist system basically is completely destroyed to the ground and disappears and all these people are out of work and all that but under a quote-unquote market socialist system you end up with basically a state that will have to artificially keep these afloat these failing enterprises right this happened in yugoslavia what did yugoslavia do well what they did was they had an uh, two options either you can increase taxes on the population so that you can uh, basically have this uh, reserve cash that you can use to fund failing enterprises within this market system that you have or you can take loans from the outside in this in yugoslavia's case it was imf loans um, what did this result in? Ballooning IMF uh, loan uh, taking basically resulted in, well, ballooning debt for Yugoslavia to the point that it basically broke Yugoslavia's back and was one of the many reasons for the collapse of that state. Uh, regardless of all its positives and successes, this was a fundamental failing. And also another failing of these market socialist systems is that because you end up with failing uh, enterprises, you end up with people who are unemployed. These unemployed people can't just be funneled into the successful enterprises because the successful enterprises have a limited amount of uh, places for work. So what did Yugoslavia do? They basically shipped off masses, of, uh, massive amounts of people to uh, Austria, to Germany, to the Nordic countries, and everywhere else as basically surplus labor. So uh, if you don't want to have um, homeless people at home, you just kind of export them, which is not exactly the solution. So market socialism is not the 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 uh, uh, solutions painted as. But one thing I want to add about the cooperatives and trade unions and whatnot: in a cooperative, you kind of care more about yourself right? Because that's the point of it. You're not working for some boss that's like a nameless, faceless guy that has a super yacht, which he takes his regular yacht out of and then parks his yacht back into a super yacht. Um, you have yourself and all the people around you that you know, that you you know share a beer with and go have pizza with, people that you know on a first name basis. All of you guys are equal within this cooperative enterprise, and you want it to do as best as possible. The thing is, though, you if, if you genuinely care about yourself and those around you uh, within a workplace, then you want to give them maternity leave. You want to to give them better wages. You want to give them paid uh, vacation days, etc., etc. The thing is that uh, capitalist A in this other enterprise, which is organized regularly as a, a, a standard capitalist enterprise with the board of directors and the workers have no say, those ones exploit the ever, sh ever living shit out of their workers. They completely and uh, utterly have no regard for uh, maternity leave, for sick days, for vacation, for and everything else. Um, so what does this mean? This means that the enterprise that's run by the capitalist ends up having a competitive edge because they're the ones that get more out of the market they have higher levels of profit they work their uh, workers longer they uh, sell their products even cheaper so that they could you know uh, get a larger uh, share of the market what does this mean for your cooperative enterprise and capitalist system it means that it won't do as well as the capitalist enterprise we even see this right now uh, Mon uh, mondragon which is the one of the biggest experiments with cooperatives in spain it was started i think uh in the middle of the last uh, century um it is 
a good example of a cooperative system, but we have to realize that within those cooperatives, they have members and non-members. And the members are those who are, you know, all equal in the enterprise and can vote and can do everything that they want to do uh, about the uh, enterprise, what to produce, how much to produce, where it goes, etc. While the non-members are basically this exploited labor, just like in any regular capitalist um, uh, enterprise. So it's a in England, in, in uh, I was gonna say in America. Well, in American English, you I think you guys call this ca a catch twenty two. Basically, mm -hmm. damned if you do, damned if you don't. Right? Um, there's no way a TLDR. There's no way that a cooperative enterprise can have a competitive edge over a regular capitalist enterprise within a capitalist system because the regular capitalist enterprise will uh, exploit its workers further. It will work them harder. It will pay them less, and it will uh, have more at the end in profits to reinvest into the circuit of capital in order to grow further. And this will directly undermine the work of your standard. Uh, quote unquote, let's say socialist uh, cooperative within a capitalist system. There's a place to talk about cooperatives under socialism, but that's not the conversation we're having today. Oh, but Hakim, uh, mm -hmm. come on. This is the beauty of capitalism. You can vote with your dollar. You know, maybe <laughs> the, the, the cooperative is going to have a much more expensive sweater, but because it's a cooperative and you as a socialist want to support it, that's the sweater you should buy. Come on, cooperatives can absolutely survive in a market <laughs> economy as long as there are enough uh, leftists to support it. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. So basically what you're telling me is that there's some weird social or quasi-social uh, implication in society that would make you think, hmm, I, I need to support this en this cooperative enterprise rather than what most people re actually think about, which is their material interests when they go. They look for the cheapest <laughs> fucking sweater. They don't care about the, the if it's made by cooperative or not. They have their own bills and bullshit to fucking think about. And a real world is That's just not That's absolute bullshit, man. Everybody <laughs> rationally spends their money. They only give it to... Uh, the most ethical, moral, and progressive businesses around. Nobody, what the fuck is material interest? The fuck are you fucking communist? Man? I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry, I forgot. There is ethical consumption under capitalism, okay? We can have cooperatively produced Funko Pops, all right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so the short version is capitalism will not share. So even if you try to establish some kind of socialist tendencies within a capitalist structure, it's always just going to get dragged back down to the level of capitalist exploitation um, and profiteering. So I think that's the problem with, with trying to, to find a middle ground. There will never be a middle ground. It will always be capitalism's domain, or it will have moved beyond capitalism to the point where you don't want to find a middle ground with it. Thank you for giving uh, coherence to our Slavo-Arab babble. <laughs> 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 no, absolutely. Well said. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, but but without the two of us, uh, J if JT was the only person running this podcast, it would last for ten minutes <laughs> because he would and very be incredibly eloquently and precisely say everything like properly It'd be nice and, and concise you know, you, you and organized. Would, with this beautiful, <laughs> like, yeah, the fucker, the, the fucker yeah. thing. Yes, yes. <laughs> with this uh, beautiful argument. radio voice. Mm, yes. <laughs> oh shucks. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Come go on. on, bombard us with more stupidity. Go All on. right, let's see what we got. Um, so another common one that we see uh, from reformists is, look, we just need to get money out of politics. There's no need to be extreme mm -hmm. and talk about revolution. If we can just make lobbying illegal, then the politicians will have to listen to the people. Look, uh, yeah, this is the thing. Um, we just need to get money out of politics, and I would like to fucking ride a, uh, a purple unicorn. It doesn't change the <laughs> fact that some things are... Most likely not going to happen. Look, if you can... I, that's not even what I was going to say. If you could make it work, then try. You can't make it work. That's the, uh, the, the gist of this entire conversation that we've been having is that the political system is directly formed and funded by the capitalist class. The capitalist class will not... And I repeat this because it needs to be repeated. The capitalist class will not lose elections that they pay for. Right? They have yep. their candidates. They have their laws. They have their lobbyists. They know exactly what's going to happen before the results even come out because they're the ones who wrote the fucking paper. Uh, the end all and be all of it is this: we can get, to, we can try to get money out of politics, but try to bring up that law in, uh, is it the Senate they, the, in the U.S. that decides on laws? I don't fucking remember now. <laughs> it's it's a convoluted process, but TLDR sometimes. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, you can try to bring up a law to the Senate, to the Congress, to the fucking uh, House of Boobaloos. I don't fucking know, right? You can try <laughs> to bring up the stupid law, and what ends up happening is it's just going to get shot down. 
Just like fucking John McCain was in Vietnam and fuck him. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that's the, the, the my point. Yeah, I, I don't I honestly don't have much to add. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, how okay, eliminate eliminate money out of politics. Just like in the previous episode, I will say what the fuck does that even mean? Exactly right. I I, I want to add this point. Uh, if you don't mind me cutting you off, it's the, the, I've heard a couple of people say this, um, and you see that again. It's well-meaning uh, liberals or like you know uh, baby leftists. They're like, oh yeah, but if we put um, donation limits on campaigns to politicians, I'm like, yeah, okay, do that, and then you're gonna see, oh fucking Jeff Bezos gave a thousand dollars to the politician he wants on his record, but you don't know that in you know their little secret fucking eyes wide shut parties and their fucking you know yacht meetings, he doesn't <laughs> slide money to him or put property in his name or other sorts of shit. Sh- sets up some fucking shell company and then starts paying him through that way which is basically what happens in every other country where lobbying is technically quote-unquote illegal all the bribing still happens it just happens in more roundabout ways they have the system set up for themselves if voting actually changed something they wouldn't make it legal no i think that's that's critical to understand um but you mentioned voting and that brings us to another another one of the common objections is the United States is a democracy, uh-huh. and that means we need to make our voices heard through the ballot box, not by force. As you just said, um, if voting changed anything, they'd make it illegal. So what do we think about trying to make our voices heard through the ballot box? Is that is that possible? Is that a viable option? I mean, it's, it's funny to preach the ballot box from an American perspective when almost every single massive change that has come about in the U.S. was not through the fucking ballot box. I mean, the U.S. earned its independence through revolution. The U.S. expelled the, the feudal form of slavery, sure, replaced it with a new one, but you get my point. Through what? Through a civil war. Jim Crow was combated through riots in the streets. Hell, you defeated us, the evil communists, through everything, just not the ballot box. You know, the the, the American way, quote-unquote, forward was never through the ballot box. While the right to vote, in my opinion, is extremely important, uh, even though, you know, very often it doesn't do almost anything, uh, it has been earned again through the blood and sweat of many progressive movements, uh, which were not earned through the ballot box. You cannot earn the ballot box through the fucking uh, ballot box. And, you know, today's it's today today's form of the ballot box has, uh, has lost on pretty much all its material value and has become more of a symbol to make yourself feel better every four years by plucking a piece of paper down a box or in you guys as more developed countries, you know, clicking on a tablet and thinking, I don't know, hey, Michelle, you did some good old political activism. That's enough for the next four years. Now let's uh, go slurp some smoothies and eat some eggs Benedict for brunch <laughs> or whatever you fucking people eat. But you you, you get my point. And that most things have not been earned through the ballot box, my friends. And this is why, sorry, I was just... <laughs> It's a silly point to mention, but I just was reminded of it. Um, the funny thing about this, oh, you know, making uh, our voice heard through the ballot box. I remember there's, um, uh, if you're unaware, there's elections are coming up in Iraq. Uh, early elections, it's a fucking mess. Um, but uh, b- basically, like, half the political uh, system and uh, the establishment has, is boycotting the other half, and it's a mess. But there's a video, uh, or a couple of videos that have been going around on this part of the internet where you see people literally buying votes. Literally, it's like a black van that pulls up and it gives people like it, it, like uh, some money and they're like, yeah, sign here, uh, stamp here, put your fucking uh, fingerprint here. All right, now you're like, you're voting for this guy. <laughs> and this is just how, <laughs> this is how the belt. Classic. Yeah, and this is the free and uh, fair election process that happens. And the United States, it's not much better, honestly, with your, what, 52% uh, democratic participation rate. Um, so, yeah, but my point is, um, the, uh, Malcolm X in all his greatness, he said something, he said, it's, uh, the bullet or the ballot. And this, he is not the only one to have said this, but, uh, he's the one I believe to have said it in the most, uh, eloquent way. Um, and when we see that the people can't get change through the ballot box, the only thing that's left is the bullet, right? 
Um, the United States and most Western European countries and most countries around the world, whether they call themselves democratic or not, um, when you look at their democratic processes, even if some, ooh, you know, right-wing uh, freedom index fucking institute think tank thinks that the uh, election process is fair and legal, what you realize is the policies that get passed are never in favor of the people. It's never reduced taxes on poor people and increased taxes on the rich. It's never limits on the uh, rights of uh, the property rights of those who are mega wealthy. It's never something like, you know, subsidies for the poor or some shit. It never is that. It's always almost across the board thing nine out of 10 times, if not, you know, 99 out of 100 times. It is something that directly benefits the ruling class and their interests, even though we supposedly live in a democratic uh, system where everybody can vote however they want, etc., etc. Uh, the best example of this is that when we bring up the question of universal health care, poll after poll has revealed or shown the fact that in the United States, most Americans are for universal health care. It doesn't matter what form it fucking takes, right? But they want uh, universal health care like exists in Norway or France or wherever else, or even fucking uh, Bolivia, right? Like just regular uh, public health care. But what do we see? We see a private healthcare system, despite the fact that supposedly you live in a fully democratic uh, and representative system where if you wanted to, you just bring up the proposal and vote on it and it will get passed. But it never has been in the United States. This is just a simple uh, example. But at the end of the day, it always uh, annoys because it just kind of bring loops back on the issue of, oh, you know, we can just reform our way to a better system. Well, the only way that reform actually takes place is when the ruling class actually feels threatened in their power and privilege so that they then eventually concede a bit of, uh, of their power and privilege so that they can maintain the most of it while the working class gets placated and then loses their evolutionary edge and forgets about it, basically. And then the second they forget, they start... Uh, austerity policies and start defunding and uh, privatizing and all that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, we're getting to the point here in, in the United States, at least, where most people, whether, you know, whether they believe in, in the American dream and America as, a, as a, a project or not, they are feeling like their vote doesn't matter. And that's part of the reason we see such an abysmal turnout, it's like very small percentages of the American population go out to vote. And part of that is because it's it's not a national holiday and it's difficult to vote and all that stuff. But a lot of times it's because people have, they've lost faith in the electoral process, um, especially on, on the left here in the U.S. But um, let's move on to another one. And this is, once you get past the, well, electoralism doesn't do anything point, you still have a sticking point where people will say, well, we need change, but violence is never okay. Like, if we take up arms, we're no better than the right. And they'll say, uh, revolution is inherently authoritarian, and isn't authoritarianism something that socialists need to avoid? I find violence such a hijacked term. I mean, it, it, it makes me want to eat my own foot. <laughs> so is it violence when you are, I don't know, evicted from an apartment because you lost your job? Is it violence when the natural resources bubbling right below your people's land are taken and sold off at, I don't know, 50% margins abroad without a single tax dollar coming back to your fucking community? Is it violence when uh, you are denied, I don't know, medical treatment because you aren't wealthy enough? Is it violence when you create a product worth value X but are paid X divided by 10? In my opinion, yes, it is. In most Marxists' mm -hmm. opinion, I believe the answer would be yes, it is. So there is no such thing as absence of violence in this system. Therefore, by being against the overthrow of this system, you are participating in said violence. One could even argue that uh, in a world where, I don't know, what's the worst thing? Uh, yeah, over 20 million people die because they can't have a Snickers bar to keep them alive. Your active inaction is more violent than violent pursuit of change. Yeah, yeah. completely right. Someone's always getting hurt. The only thing we can change is what they're getting hurt mm. over. The annoying part of that statement, I know I keep saying annoying because a lot of these points are technically annoying, um, 
uh, not technically they are just annoying but uh, the uh, when the ruling class incarcerates you evicts you underpays you uh, steals your surplus value um, doesn't contribute to the com your community uh, dodges taxes uh, completely controls the economic and political system for their aims uh, causing you to basically rot in poverty and misery that is not violence that's law and order but the second you decide to fight back all of a sudden it's considered violence I don't like that talking point and it's kind of skewed uh, into a uh, uh, I don't want to say it but it's a very bourgeois mindset um, generally when we talk about uh, authoritarianism this is a non-issue it is not something that truly exists in the material world there are things that can be said to be authoritarian but when we talk about uh, the concept of reform and revolution if you do not end the system that you currently exist in which is destroying you your community and your environment then what you can end up with is just the extinction of the species otherwise the only way to break this cycle is through violence and what is it to say that basically a day or a week or a month or a year of violence to break a system that has been violent for centuries and if we don't break it we'll be violent for maybe decades or a couple of centuries more if climate change doesn't completely destroy us so i think it's misguided and a bit um uh you know of a metaphysical mindset to think that violence is only this one-way straight um and not a means to an end. Yeah, I think you had it right when you were saying that uh, violence by the state is is construed as law and order. Like you see, you know, the police beating up protesters and throwing them in jail, and that's justice. Hmm. Um, that's the way things are. It's keeping uh, keeping the peace. Um, when these instruments of capital are the ones going out and and breaking up peaceful assemblies, right? They're not instruments of peace. They're instruments of chaos and violence. But we don't see it like that because they are part of the state apparatus. They are part of this system that has been sold to us as uh, good and necessary. The way we, you know, we as an Ameri Americans typically think of violence is very much um, individualized. Yeah. Like if I go out and throw a rock at a police station or at a military guy that is violence or that is even maybe terrorism they mm -hmm. would say but if i get shot with a rubber bullet or beaten with a baton that's not violence i probably had it coming to me that's yeah. what most americans would think and that's that's uh, that's a mindset i think we really need to get over mm -hmm. uh, if we're going to address these problems that we face and of course, the media, not only the, in the United States, but it, it is especially within the United States, but everywhere around the world, tries to depict, uh, of course, because they say serve the interests of the ruling class, they tried to depict protests, particularly for economic aims, uh, movements of the working class, as inherently violent as something barbaric that always you know, needs to be fought against, All, again, within this framework of, of law and order. Uh, when my country was being destroyed and ravaged by uh, American bombs and missiles and bullets, um, it was because U.S. capitalism has decreed that the resources that sit beneath my feet belong to them and only them, and it shouldn't serve my country and my people. It should serve to fund the uh, you know the yachts and the super yachts of the Dick Cheney's and then the Colin Powell's and George Bush's of the world, and even those behind the scenes that weren't directly within the political system but still pulled the strings. This is the inherent violence of the capitalist system. This is not something that can be reformed. You cannot stop imperialism from happening. You can only break the back of the capitalist system, destroy it, and overthrow capitalism in order so that imperialism as a system stops. I don't. I'd like. I. I don't want to mm -hmm. interlude in such a beautiful thing. I know that was perfect. Put forward. <laughs> yeah, I was like just uh, sitting here massive hard on <laughs> taking a sip of my mm, drink mwah, I mean, <laughs> very very nice i mean but like if, if you really want to know uh what's like genuinely necessary is it reform or is it the revolution literally just ask an old disenfranchised reformist yeah they i they will almost always be the first one to tell you that they were wrong in thinking that you can negotiate with capital mm -hmm. 
And I'm not just talking capitalists with capital, with the system. Even when there is a capitalist, like a class trader of its own class, who wants to actually, like at a late stage of his life, when he realizes how fucked up everything is. And let's even imagine there's hundreds of thousands of them. You know, Jeff Bezos wakes up tomorrow and reads Marx, even though I'm like 100% sure he did mm. already. Uh, the system will fucking eat those people as yeah. well. You cannot reform your way out of something so complex so devious and so hungry that you know it, the eternal need for growth will outgrow the most benevolent of uh, ideals and just to add on to that about talking to a, a old and uh, you know um tired reformist well, that's if you can even find them. The ones who were true to their word and actually did want socialism but just wanted through quote-unquote peaceful and quote-unquote electoral means are mostly dead, right? And the other ones are ones who sold out and became reformists for the capitalist class and basically wanted to maintain a system and never genuinely believed exactly. in reaching socialism. So, uh, yeah. The ones who meant it are all dead. The ones who didn't, well, they're, you know, sitting al along with the... They may have smaller yachts, but... Give it <laughs> Sorry, go on. Give, give an example of, for, for the audience, yes. for people who might not right. know. Like I'll, I'll, give, my I'll give my favorite. I'll give my favorite example because um, it's an example that's uh, close to my heart. Um, if, you're, if people are unaware, uh, in the early 70s, there was a man named Salvador Allende, or Allende because the double L is with a Y, but I'm not Spanish, so for, yep. like, uh, <laughs> forgive me <laughs> for the misspelling. I'll be saying Allende. Um, uh, Allende was a doctor, he was a physician, just like I am, and he was a committed Marxist. But, for whatever reason, he was not convinced of the violent means necessary to maintain power. He, like Chavez and like Maduro uh, and like other people who are well-intentioned but still mistaken, um, he wanted to maintain, he wanted to conquer state power through electoral means, and he wanted to maintain state power through electoral means. Now, what happened in uh, the early 70s? He won the election and he came to power. And what resulted afterwards was the greatest reaction of the capitalist class against Chile and against Allende to the tune of that. Even Henry Kissinger said the um, uh, future of Chile is too important to uh, be, uh, it's, it's too important for the Chilean people to decide. Basically saying that because they democratically chose a communist, um, they made the wrong choice. America's candidate was not electable. And hence, the current candidate that uh, stands against American interests and capitalist interests needs to be destroyed. And that's exactly what happened. After building a very impressive uh, economic uh, well, foundation uh, through nationalizations and uh, very interesting cybernetic planning of the economy, etc., etc., basically we had uh, at the, we were at the cusp of a very interesting development within socialist uh, uh, organization. Um, what happened was the capitalist class at first tried to defame him, and when the people stood by his side, then they basically bribed uh, people. For example, if you're unaware, Chile is a very long country, um, and trucks are required to put, bring everything, uh, like to transport all the stuff. Uh, and the truck union was basically entirely bribed. They dumped uh, the CIA and uh, the Chilean bourgeoisie dumped immense amounts of money into uh, that uh, truck drivers union to basically tell them stop working, uh, strike, so that uh, the con the country basically grinds to a halt. And because of the very intelligent planning of the uh, Chilean socialists, they had a system in place um, called Cybersyn, which you should read about, it's very interesting, which kind of mitigated that, and then they realized, fuck, this isn't enough to displace uh, Allende. So what did they do next? They called in the military, they picked a guy uh, named Pinochet, a fascist, who basically attacked the uh, presidential palace, uh, laid siege to the capital, conquered it, uh, killed uh, Allende, and took power, and then for the next uh, several years, there was a fascist dictatorship in Chile, which was known for murdering tens of thousands of people, known for uh, having a system of quote-unquote free market capitalism being run um, that basically devastated the country, caused infant mortality and poverty to skyrocket. Basically, all the gains of the uh, very nice and rosy uh, socialist electoral victory being rolled back would be it uh, nationalization of resources or uh, the uh, providing of healthcare and education for the poor, etc. And what did we have as a result of this? All this, I was going to switch to Arabic for a second, all this tab, uh, tab means like uh, this fatigue, 
all this work, all this tiring, like uh, uh, endless labor that they tried to make socialism a reality in Chile through electoral means was shut down in an instant because they didn't choose to actually pick up the gun and fight to maintain the system that they wanted to maintain that was for the good of their own people. That is why, for example, uh, Chile collapsed after two years or so, while China, which conquered power in 1949, still exists. Same for Vietnam, same for Cuba. At the end of the day, if you truly believe in an ideal and want to protect it, then you should be ready to protect that with the gun. Words and uh, voting posters and ballots aren't going to keep you in power, as sad as it is. To quote Mao, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Yeah, even the most principled and dedicated and well-meaning uh, reformists, if you take power and you're not able to, if you're not cognizant of what's coming down the pike, I mean, mm. every single time capital is going to react. They are going to mount a resistance and it's going to be overwhelming. Yeah. That's why it's, it's, it's both interesting and terrifying to watch this new surge of leftist sentiment in, in Latin America, or maybe not new, but growing sentiment. Because we know that it's going to go very poorly. We're going to see some some examples of probably some U.S. staged coups. Mm-hmm. Um, We've already seen two. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah you don't have to wait long. Thank God the, the CIA is incompetent as mm, fuck right now. Yeah. Hopefully it remains mm. so. Yeah. I mean, they've got their hands full with the uh, the Havana Syndrome microwave brain ray. <laughs> <laughs> my God. Uh, Some people oh, drank a shit. bit too much. Oh. Mommy, mommy, my tummy hurts. <laughs> my tummy hurts. It's, it's a fucking conspiracy by the commies. Uh, oh, fuck. I mean, it <laughs> bodes well for, for, for global communism yeah. if they've developed a, a brain ray and, yeah. and the CIA can't crack it. Of course, the Cuban comrades. Of course. Of course it's them. Yep. <laughs> I was going <gonna, laughs> to say it's a fucking James Bond-ass fucking <laughs> like mystery yeah. weapon. What is this shit? It's like a Batman fucking cartoon. Thousands of American soldiers get shot with real bullets. Sorry, we cannot pay for this. Yeah. A bunch of CIA guys say, oh, my God, I drank too much. My tummy hurts. <laughs> Here you go, $100,000. Yeah. It was immediate, too. I mean, the, immediately they, they got that, that health care bill mm-hmm. through uh, through the Senate. It was mm-hmm. awful. Yeah, it, like it, it stood on Biden's desk for less than an mm-hmm. hour. Yeah. yeah Insane. Like the oh, f- I wonder which interests he serves. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I was just going to add, sorry, about the the point that you mentioned, which is this, um, about if you're a reformist and you're well-meaning and they're just going to fight you tooth and nail and then eventually kill you. Look what they did to Bernie. Look what they did to to Corbyn. Yeah. They were both well-meaning, but at the end of the day, they were like left liberals. Nothing that they wanted to do was explicitly, ooh, socialist or Marxist. It was very Mm -hmm. benign reform. And look how they had their character assassination, how they had to be protected because people directly want to attack them. Uh, Corbyn had this bullshit... uh, anti-semitism claim thrown on him uh yeah. bernie was basically smeared into the earth right and not given any talking time on most mainstream media etc so it's just it's fucking nonsense and i think the people who generally believe this either i say this a lot in my videos but you're either blind or you're stupid if you believe this <laughs> <laughs> sorry you're going yeah. no that's pretty much all i had it's that it's it... Here in the United States especially, and I I hate having to bring it back to the U.S. so much um, because I'd like this to be a more international show, but we haven't had experience with with revolution or revolutionary ideas in quite a long time here. Um, The most recent thing that you might consider even vaguely revolutionary was... Uh, Fighting the mask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the masks are communism. Um, probably Martin Luther King Jr. in the civil rights era. I mean, even back then, even with something as mild as that, you know, asking for um, for equal rights, for to be being able to drink from the same water fountain as a white person, you had tremendous backlash against that. And there was a, there's a great um, old comic pain that makes the rounds every once in a while. It's a picture of, of MLK talking to a news guy, and like there's flipped over cars and things are on fire. And uh, he's saying, I'll lead a, another nonviolent march tomorrow. And it's just, mm. it's, it comes back to that idea of violence. Like anything that you do, uh, whether you're, you know, laying siege to the Capitol or just marching for, for equal rights, that will always be construed as violence by those in power. Mm-hmm. And that's something we need to, we need to get through our heads. Yeah, it's really important for people to understand that 
uh, the system inherently by itself is violent and it's not only institutions which exist in capitalism which are violent but the consequences of uh, setting up the world the way we have it right now setting up our economy setting up our governments uh, setting up uh, enterprises etc etc is causing immense suffering and very often directly, I'm not even going to use the term indirectly, very often, very directly inflicting violence on uh, even like relatively privileged members of society, but it's unimaginable to us uh, how much pain and violence they inflict on some of the, the most oppressed from the, the poorest places on earth. So it really needs to be put across that... Uh, literally not doing anything about a woman getting the shit beaten out of her across the street is uh, worse than going and attempting to stop the dude beating the shit out of her through the use of mm -hmm. violence. By using violence against capitalism, you're doing just that. You are trying to not allow the system to beat the shit out yeah. of our environment and, and the working class. It's not violence, and it's self-defense. Yeah. It, it's self-defense, and it should always be self-defense. But not only against institutions, very important, but against the system in yeah. general. Exactly right, yeah. Well, I was going to say, time for our favorite segment, okay? Tell me, each of you, which is your favorite uh, CIA uh, overthrow <laughs> of a democratically oh, elected... No. <laughs> oh, Fuck. it's so awful. Oh, my God. They are which the one? There's dozens to organization. fucking pick. I love when they dropped pigs on this bay <laughs> in Cuba. <laughs> oh, my and God. Like, why would they drop pigs on there? And then, like, they called the... the it, the Bay of Pigs, mm. like Castro was like smoking a cigar and like just mm. pigs started. Yeah, it's the weirdest falling thing. Falling on the thing. Yeah. It's very confusing. I don't know. You Americans are very strange people, yeah. my friend. Yeah. I understand. Okay, we want to give bacon to the to the communists. Maybe yeah. if they eat a bit of bacon, they will stop being as communists. <laughs> and it almost worked too. We yeah. almost got them. <laughs> just like when they sent the fucking the coup in, in Venezuela. <laughs> when a guy, when a fisherman <laughs> with a Glock basically ended the, the fucking coup. <laughs> It's just uh, like pop, where pop, the pop. fuck you think you're going, boy? <laughs> oh, so fuck. funny. I love seeing the picture because he's just like a shirtless fucking like. He wasn't even like a young <laughs> guy. He was an old dude, fucking shirtless with uh, shorts that don't fucking fit. And you see his uh, his fucking uh, sh uh, fishing gear right behind him, and you see the fucking lock right in his, in his waistband. You're like, yeah, that's a. It's like yeah. Fuck. Oh, me amigo, today I caught uh, three catfish, yeah. four other small 50 gram fish, and 12 <laughs> Americans. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a good day. Can't wait to throw this on the grill. <laughs> <Fuck>. <laughs> Jesus. All right. Yeah. Well, we're at about, wow, almost an hour and a half. Um, let's wrap this up. So basically, what we're saying here is that um, revolution bad, violence bad, uh, and vote blue no matter who, right? Exactly right, yeah. The uh, reform is the Chad Wojak and revolution is the Soy Wojak. That's what we're trying to say. <laughs> yeah, if, if Americans, if you've ever thought that you genuinely have a representative democracy, you have a literal dementia patient as your fucking president. <laughs> For fuck's sake. Yeah. Because yeah, you guys picked that guy, right? JT, I know. Like, it was, it's, it's clear. This is the dude you picked. This is the guy you wanted, the demented guy. <laughs> From the Sorry, very the, beginning, I, I knew that was my man. I have Mr. I have hairy legs, Mr. Uh, you know, uh, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm Joe Biden's wife. That guy. <laughs> <laughs> he told us about corn pop. He told us all these stories from from the segregation era. Oh, uh, he's my favorite racist. Poor kids can be just as good as white oh kids. Oh my god! <laughs> and then he fucking says, "As black kids, as Mexicans, or whatever the fuck he says." Oh my god! I, Jeez, they fucking load him, load him up with fucking benzos or barbiturates right before he goes on stage. This is bullshit. Yeah, I love, I love when that guy was like, bomb the shit out of those dirty slavs back in the day. Oh, he was my favorite. He was one of the biggest, like, ooh, let's fucking show them who's boss, baby. Yeah, Exactly, yeah, yeah that's, that's why I say he's Good my favorite times. racist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yep. All right, gang. Well, that's that's what we've got for today. That's reform <laughs> versus revolution. Thank you for your for your time. Thank you for listening to our our, our degeneracy here at the end. Um, I love how if you have JT the time, has to cut us off from our bullshit. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I need Joe to... Biden sees a black guy and he calls him the N word fifty times because every time he says the N word, he forgot he forgets he said the N word. <laughs> I'm God. cutting so you guys out. I'm, God, I'm, God, I'm God, muting God. both of you. I'm, I'm ending this episode. <laughs> Right. If you've got time, go read go read Joe Biden and the N word. Yeah. Joe right, Biden um, masterpiece wake up. written by Hakeem JT and you got Wake uh, up, Joe Biden. Wake up, Joe Biden. <laughs> Joe, wake up. Okay, wake sorry, up, Joe. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm tuning you out. Go read <laughs> Joe Biden. Reform. Wake up. <laughs> Dang it. Wake up, Joe. <laughs> 9-11. Wake up, Joe Biden. Do you look? This has been the D program. I'm JT. <laughs> uh, I'm Hakeem. I am wake up Joe Biden. You got me. No more Suri, no more Turkey. Two yil. Sorry, God. We're signing off. Have a good day, everybody. Oh, and remember, oh, wake up Joe Biden. <laughs>